Thank you so much for the kind introduction. And um, I, too, am very, very pleased to see so many people um, coming out the evening to hear about such an important issue, human trafficking um, and the modern day slavery. Um, I first became aware of issues related to human trafficking about 20 years ago. Um, I was working in Thailand um, doing some, an evaluation project along the Thai-Cambodian border um, in displaced persons camps in that area. Um, I had been spending a few weeks in the border and I had noticed uh, visiting the camps that there were almost no teenagers in the camps. Um, some of them hadn't survived the Khmer Rouge days, and that was one explanation. Um, but it seemed something else was going on. Um, I started asking questions initially. No one would talk to me about, um, about the issues. But the longer I was in the camp, the more they got to know me, the stories began coming out. Um, the boys, it turned out, had been forcibly recruited um, by the military operation rebel groups that were operating in and near the camps. Um, they, the militaries would come in at night, uh, snatch up young boys as soldiers for their, their uh, military activities back in Cambodia. The girls were, were another issue. That didn't, what happened to the boys upset me, but didn't shock me. What happened to the girls, though, that every Sunday, apparently, um, brothel owners from Bangkok um, would come into the camps knowing that all of the aid workers were gone for the weekend. And they would go through the camp, identify all of what were described to me as the pretty girls. Um, and they were pulled out of the camps um, and sent to work in brothels in Bangkok. And I asked, well, what happened to the not so pretty girls? Because they weren't in the camp either. I said, oh, that's another story. Um, they were recruited along with the boys to go into the military. And they said, well, what are they doing? Are they fighting? And they said, well, most of them are cooking, providing sex services to the soldiers. Um, and they're used as mind clearers. And I said, what does that mean? Well, what that meant is that they walked in front of the soldiers so that they would blow up the landmines. That was my first exposure to human trafficking. I came back from Thailand, um, wrote about the situation. It was one of the reasons that I ended up writing a book on refugee women um, and trying to bring attention to the issues. But at the time, nobody used the term trafficking. Um, I now know that that's what it was. Um, but at the time, there was almost no attention placed on the issue of human trafficking. 20 years later, it's fortunately become a major issue on the international agenda. Um, and there is not only public policy and academic interest in the issues, um, but there's also a willingness to try to tackle some of the underlying problems. And that's really what I want to talk about today. Um, talk a bit about the causes of trafficking. Give you a better sense of what happens to the trafficked victims. Um, and then talk about where we are in terms of public policy today uh, and present what I would propose as a better approach to addressing trafficking issues for the future. What is meant by trafficking? That's certainly where we have to start. What is encompassed in the trafficking definition? Well, the trafficking is now defined by a international protocol. It's referred to usually by um, experts in the area as the Palermo Protocols on Trafficking. Um, it's part of a UN convention um, on organized crime, uh, transnational organized crime. Um, the definition developed as a result of a great deal of negotiations amongst governments, trying to figure out what was would be included in the definition what was not. Um, a lot of the discussion was actually how to treat the issue of prostitution, um, whether, as some countries believed, um, recruitment into prostitution would always be a criminal activity and be defined as trafficking, or whether women, girls, not girls, but women in particular, um, could volunteer to be prostitutes and would therefore not be considered to have been trafficked. 
The definition that was finally agreed upon has a number of elements. I won't read it. You can do that um, yourself. But it includes the recruitment, transfer, transport of individuals. That's one component to it. Secondly, it involves the threat of force, the use of force, abduction, um, deception, coercion, all of these types of characteristics, meaning that it's involuntary. Um, or if it's voluntary, people don't really know what it is that they're getting into. Um, and it provides a benefit to others because the others are able to exploit the individuals who have been trafficked. So it's the recruitment and transport, the forced deception, coercion, and exploitation are important elements. At the same time that the trafficking convention was under, protocol was under negotiation, there were also negotiations on a very closely related issue, um, and that's human smuggling. And there was an effort to try to distinguish between individuals who had been trafficked from individuals who were smuggled. Smuggling, by contrast to trafficking, involves a legal entry into another country. That trans-border action doesn't need to happen in the way of trafficking. Um, and it generally means that somebody is transporting a person illegally across the border for their financial gain on that. The differences are not always very obvious, though. For the most part, trafficking is considered to be a crime against victims who have been coerced and exploited, whereas smuggling is considered to be a crime against states where the, the integrity, the sovereignty of a state has been violated um, as people are illegally moved into that state. You'll see from this diagram, though, that there is an area in between, that shaded area, where it overlaps between one and the other. Reason for this is that increasingly people are paying extremely high prices in order to be smuggled into other countries. Um, estimates from places of some parts of China is that the cost of smuggling can be as much as thirty, forty, even fifty thousand dollars. Now, most poor people, and that's a lot of the people who are looking for to be smuggled can't afford those types of prices. So what happens for them is that they go into debt bondage. They sell their souls, in effect, to the smugglers, um, who then exploit their labor, in many cases, take away their passports, prevent them from leaving their place of employment until they pay off their debts, often holding their families hostage um, until the debt is paid. In that situation, a voluntary act of smuggling can easily become now a coerced act of trafficking. And it's important to understand the connections amongst these issues. Now, you'll notice in my talk that I'm not going to give you any numbers. Um, a lot of talks start off saying, as State Department often does, that there are 600 to 800,000, I've just given you a number, um, of people who've been trafficked. Um, I call these guesstimates because we really don't know how many people have been trafficked. Um, by definition, trafficking is an illegal underground activity. Um, what we see are people who have been identified as having been trafficked because they are sometimes apprehended um, in the course of other criminal activities. Uh, there's a bust on a brothel, and therefore you find some people who had been um, been trafficked, or perhaps they escape from their traffickers. And what we see are the tip of the iceberg. What we don't know is how many people there are beneath that surface. Um, and we don't know whether these are grossly over-exaggerated numbers um, or whether this is, in fact, what the population of trafficking victims are. Um, the State Department is the principal source of information um, that they and, and in Europol and Interpol have tried to come up with more credible ways of estimating. Um, and actually, some of the uh, discussions that the State Department is having with experts in trying to revise and define a methodology for counting um, the uncountable 
um, is worthy, but I'm frankly skeptical that they're ever going to be able to really do a good job in doing that. What we do assume, though, is that a majority of those who have been trafficked are women and children. Um, some estimates go as high as 80%, maybe in that category. Um, but again, it's not really known, and um, we don't have very good hard data. Let me say a few words about the forms of trafficking, because trafficking can take many forms, as my example in Thailand indicated. Um, certainly, the type of trafficking that has gotten the most attention is trafficking for sexual exploitation, um, for prostitution, for child pornography, for a range of activities in which, and again, largely women um, and also children, um, are trafficked from one place to another um, in order to exploit their them in terms of these types of activities. And that has really been a lot of the focus of attention. I'll come back to that issue. Um, some, again, guesstimates are that they may not be the majority of those who have been trafficked. That, in fact, the majority of those who have been trafficked are trafficked into forced labor rather than into sexual exploitation. Um, and here again, we have a lot of different forms of forced labor. Um, one of the most prominent um, criminal investigations that has taken place in the United States in recent years um, was in agriculture um, and found a group of um, young, mostly uh, teenage boys who had been held more or less in captivity um, in a part of Florida um, where they were picking oranges. They were locked in at night. They weren't able to, um, to leave the premises. And um, they did not have any control over the monies that they earned. Um, agriculture all over the world is an area of, um, for human trafficking. Um, in the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, um, there have been years of um, children also being trafficked into plantations to work um, in various different forms of labor. So this is an international phenomenon. Um, there's also forced labor um, in mines, in fisheries, um, in sweatshops. Um, one of the mo most pervasive forms of forced labor is in domestic servitude. Um, and again, these are situations where very often the um, and it's largely women who are working in these circumstances have volunteered to migrate in order to be able to earn money, um, are working as domestic workers in pe people's households, um, and then find that their rights are severely restricted, their mobility is um, restricted, they're unable to leave the places in which they have operated. Um, are working, and very often, having been in that circumstance, they also become victims of sexual exploitation, as well as forced labor. Um, you'll see that in a lot of cases where human trafficking takes place, um, it takes place into the private realm, into the home, into the farm, into the places where there's not a lot of public scrutiny. There are not a lot of people coming in who are able to identify, see the people, the faces of those who have been trafficked, um, and identify it as such. Um, we also have trafficking for forced marriages um, around the world and for adoptions. There are children who were trafficked in order to become the adopted children of wealthy parents throughout the world. Um, and they're trafficked from poorer countries. Um, child soldiers is another example that I've already given. Um, and something which is now usually now considered to be part of human trafficking is trafficking of organs for transplant. It's a situation where the entire person doesn't necessarily move, but significant parts of them are moving from one place to another. So what causes trafficking to take place in all of these different forms? We normally look at three main areas in order to understand what's happening. Here I've started with one called the supply side. It's basically what is happening in the places of origin that makes people vulnerable to being trafficked um, or vulnerable to smuggling that can lead to trafficking. <clears throat> 
Um, and here there are a range of things that are taking place in countries of origin or areas of origin um, within a country. Um, very fundamentally, there's a lack of economic opportunities that make people desperate. desperate. They're desperate for finding something else. Um, and here, very often, deception works. Um, because when they're told that they're going to be working as a hostess in a restaurant or working as a domestic worker, what they don't necessarily understand is that what that means is that they'll actually be working in a brothel or be enslaved in a household. Now, women are particularly affected because of pervasive gender discrimination um, in many countries, particularly in access to um, employment and to education. And so their options are quite limited. And therefore, they don't, even if there are limited economic opportunities in their countries of origin, they don't necessarily have access to those opportunities. Um, and when particularly they are responsible for the support not only of themselves, but of their children, they become vulnerable to the lures of the traffickers. Societies where there's a tolerance of gender-based violence, um, where violence directed against women is tolerated, um, is seen to be a part of the natural order of things, um, trafficking will naturally flourish more than in situations where um, there are legal protections and rights of women, of children, against being abused. Now, conflict and displacement, as again my situation on the Thai-Cambodian border, um, also makes people vulnerable to being trafficked. Um, during conflict, society breaks down, families are separated, um, people don't have access to basic assistance, to the protections of their country, of their societies, of their legal systems. Um, communities are in crisis in many ways. Same thing actually happens in natural uh, disasters. Um, there's certainly a fear when the tsunami occurred in South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, that trafficking was going to accompany it, and there were major campaigns to try to make sure that traffickers didn't get a foothold. Um, same fears have been expressed about the victims of Hurricane Katrina, that having been displaced from their homes, displaced from their communities, they are um, susceptible to internal trafficking. Trafficking, again, doesn't have to be international. It can be within one's own country. Um, um, so having been displaced once, being then forced to move, coerced to move, deceived to move for other what appears to be better opportunities is something that happens. Again, generally, whenever there's a breakdown in law and order, um, traffickers can thrive. So any societies that are in crisis where, and this particularly happens if there are other forms of a breakdown in law and order. Um, in, um, Bosnia and Serbia, um, that part of the Balkans, um, during the years of the conflict, but also the repression of the Milosevic regime, um, trafficking became a way of life in many respects. Um, and the regime in Serbia actually encouraged trafficking into the rest of Europe as a way of um, getting back at Europe for the NATO um, intervention. Then there are a variety of cultural practices which don't necessarily support trafficking directly, but may provide the basis upon which trafficking can take place. In West Africa, for example, there's a very strong um, tradition of parents sending children away at a certain age as apprentices in order to learn skills and learn to be able to um, take advantage of new economic opportunities. And very often, they're apprenticed to plantation owners, to farmers, to fishermen. Um, and, but what the parents don't necessarily know or choose not to know about um, is that the children will be exploited in that circumstance um, and will be unable to leave their places of employment. So there are a whole range of things at the supply side that creates an environment in which trafficking can take place. But it isn't all on the supply side. Clearly, there's also a demand for trafficking. 
because people are exploiting others in order to usually to make money out of it. And if there isn't a demand for trafficked victims, then there won't be any real market, there won't be a financial gain. Certainly the growth of the global commercial sex industry throughout the world, fueled by the internet and other um, sex tourism, things of that sort, um, is a contributor to the growth in trafficking, certainly for the sexual exploitation. Now, very often, restrictive immigration policies can fuel trafficking. Um, where there are legitimate labor demands that aren't being filled domestically or being filled by legal foreign workers, smugglers and traffickers can just step into that niche can demand high prices, can get people into debt bondage, um, and there are a, a, there's demand from employers for that labor, and the employers will also often turn a blind eye to the illegality of the action and become complicit um, in usually what they think of as only smuggling, but which may in fact also be trafficking. Where the labor markets are unregulated, where there is very little in the way of labor standards enforcement, um, very little uh, policing of the work site, trafficking can again um, flourish and can take place. Um, I've added here military and peacekeeping operations. Um, and this is an area where what should be protective and what should be helpful to people actually turns out to be very detrimental in many situations in causing additional trafficking to take place. It makes sense, though, when you begin thinking about it. Military, peacekeepers, who are they? They're generally young men, 18, 25 years old, separated from their families in often hostile situations, um, looking for some solace, some comfort, some sex, um, frequent brothels, and when that demand is there, the traffickers come in and fill it. So the growth of trafficking in Bosnia was very much fueled um, by the NATO peacekeepers. Um, as, and we've seen a number of major scandals in peacekeeping operations in Africa in which peacekeepers have been found to be complicit with sexual exploitation um, and the trafficking of individuals. Um, and then, of course, in receiving states, that same factor of gender discrimination and toleration of gender-based violence can exist. Um, and therefore, just because the trafficked victims are being abused is not seen as something of particular concern or of particular interest to the society. But even when there's a supply of people to be trafficked, a demand for the trafficked victims, um, trafficking won't necessarily take place unless you have this third element. And that's a process by which you can facilitate the trafficking itself, facilitate the movements of people from one place to another for purposes of their exploitation. Um, and here's where the traffickers themselves, the tr criminal operations come into play. Um, some of them are transnational in nature. They're, again, the we're using guesstimates, but some of the best guesstimates are that trafficking now may reap 9, 10, 11, 12 billion dollars per year in revenues. Um, some studies are indicating that the return on the investment for human trafficking is actually higher than it is for drug trafficking or arms trafficking. Um, and partly because the people you're moving around are often helping you in that process, whereas the drugs and the arms are inanimate objects. Um, and they keep on earning the money. You sell a drug once, it's sold. You sell a woman in a brothel, and it's over and over and over again. So the return is very, very high. So the organized criminal operations, there's a major debate as to whether there's a linkage between the organized criminal elements that engage in human trafficking are linked or cooperating or part of those that are doing other forms of illegal organized crime. Um, and the, the jury is still out, I think, somewhat on the extent to which all of this form of crime um, is linked. There's evidence in both directions. Um, but, and some of it is purely domestic, um, because I keep reiterating that trafficking doesn't have to happen across international borders. 
Um, it happens within the United States. It happens within many other countries. And in fact, in some places like India, it's believed to much outweigh the number of people who are trafficked internationally. Um, and can, if the domestic um, organized crime um, can make quite a lot of money. But again, having a criminal enterprise doesn't always lead to trafficking unless you also have corrupt regimes, corrupt officials, official corruption. Um, you can think about it in a number of different ways. Um, that allows these activities to take place um, where the traffickers have bought off police officials, border officials, inspectors, um, those who might otherwise be able to intervene on behalf of the victims. Trafficking is also aided by the advancements in technology that we've seen um, and allows for more people to be trafficked to more locations more quickly and at less expense than probably ever before in human history. Um, communications revolution, the internet means that um, if you are trafficking and want to build a demand and have an easy way of recruiting your supply of trafficking victims, you can now use the internet. Uh, child, certainly internet child pornography has been a fueler of trafficking, of looking for the kids to be exploited in this respect. Transportation revolution as well. You can move people from one place to another at low cost um, and with relatively little um, intervention. And that leads to a situation, and my final point on here, is that we have, we're seeing a growth in transnational communities. Um, communities that have a foot in two different places, in two different countries, um, and maintain the ties between those countries. And very often, the initial person who is doing the recruitment is the neighbor, is the family member, is the trusted person. Um, within the community who then has ties to the places in the destination areas where the trafficking will take place. So our transnational um, nature, the globalization in effect, is what is part of what is fueling trafficking. So you can see from the causes that I've described that trafficking intersects with an awful lot of different issues. Um, and can't be seen in isolation. Um, that it involves certainly labor exploitation, sexual exploitation, as I mentioned. Um, it's an issue that involves irregular migration, meaning people who are illegally moving or being moved from one place to another. Immigration policies matter um, in thinking about what to do with regard to trafficking. Um, it's certainly an issue of human rights. Um, and the violation of those rights, both the violations that make people vulnerable to being trafficked, but also the violations of the rights of those who have already been trafficked. Um, it involves gender roles, um, because the role of women, frankly, um, in many parts of the world um, and many communities throughout the world is such that women do become more vulnerable to being trafficked because of their um, particular role and particular vulnerabilities within society. Um, it's an issue of transnational crime and certainly of concern to law enforcement agencies. Um, it's an issue related to conflict and conflict management and resolution to conflicts. Um, and probably above everything else, um, it's an issue related to poverty and to underemployment and underdevelopment. And so if you want to get at trafficking, you can't just get at it as a unidimensional issue. You have to get it, you have to address it in a very comprehensive way to get to the root causes as well as the manifestations. The policy focus today though, I think is too limited in scope um, in terms of what the particular emphasis is. Um, the emphasis has been overwhelmingly on the trafficking for sexual exploitation, particularly for prostitution. Um, and it's to the detriment in terms of not having an adequate focus um, in terms of public policy on the other forms of trafficking that I talked about, particularly in terms of forced labor, um, which tends to be ignored, frankly, um, 
consumers are very happy to have low prices in restaurants and hotels, um, cheap clothing, um, cheap food, all of that stuff, and they're not willing to ask the questions as to whose labor it is that's providing all of those benefits to them. Um, and so trafficking for forced labor continues without very, very much attention. Also, the focus tends to be on the criminal tra trafficking operations themselves, um, and it really doesn't for sufficiently certainly internationally, the US is actually fairly good at this. Um, it doesn't sufficiently look at the exploited persons themselves and what their role is, what the protections are that they require. So it's getting at the bad guys, but not necessarily providing sufficient protection to the victims of those bad guys. In dealing with the causes of trafficking, much of the money, much of the attention has been placed on public information and education. If you can just tell women and kids that they might be trafficked, they'll somehow avoid it. Um, and they won't get themselves into those bad situations. And that's almost what the logic behind some of these campaigns are. Um, and yet there's much less attention to a lot of the root causes, the underlying causes that I've mentioned. Um, and almost all of the policy focus has been on trafficking across borders. Um, and there's been very, very little attention, um, particularly because of the concerns about sovereignty about looking at trafficking within countries, within borders. Um, and we tend to ignore that um, and focus on trafficking that moves into our countries rather than maybe occurring elsewhere. And we don't even look at trafficking inside the United States very much. Um, and there are many, many concerns um, that the internal trafficking here is not getting sufficient attention. So what should we do? Well, the strategies to address trafficking are often referred to as the three Ps, prevention, prosecution, protection. So what would a prevention strategy look like if you were really trying to deal with both the underlying causes as well as the more immediate processes at work? Well, for me, one of the first things that you would have to be looking at is the empowerment of women. The extent that gender discrimination and, and gender-based violence is an underlying factor in causing trafficking, then part of the solution is empowering women um, and girls to be able to have the educational and employment opportunities, the respect for their bodies, the respect for their rights to which they're entitled. And that has to be, in my view, an important part of any strategy. Second, you have to deal with the poverty and the underdevelopment. Um, and that means having a real emphasis on poverty reduction. That means skills training. It means income generation. It means helping the countries of origin to be able to deal with the poverty and their myths that make people vulnerable to any promise from anybody to a better life. There is a role for public education and awareness programs. I think that that's clearly a need. Some of it should certainly go to trying to warn people who, women, children, um, men, about what the risks are in terms of the promise that sounds too good to be true probably is, isn't true, um, and avoiding those. Uh, some of the best public information campaigns are actually, should be directed though against the demand side. It should be directed against those of us who are benefiting from forced labor or those who are utilizing brothels and who are not necessarily knowing that it is a trafficked prostitute who is, is serving them. Um, it's education and training and some sanctions for those individuals if they continue to use the services of trafficked victims. Um, there certainly needs to be more effective protection for refugees and displaced persons. Um, some of the worst trafficking occurs in cir circumstances where people just frankly don't have enough to eat and will do anything in order to be able to get food aid and food assistance um, and who have no access to employment, can't find the food for their, ch for their children in other ways and therefore become very vulnerable to, to trafficking. And certainly, again, reducing the demand for 
exploit, exploitative labor, um, not just through public information, public education, but through a sanctions regime that really gets at those who financially benefit um, from the trafficking has to be an important part of the prevention strategy. Now, though it's a bigger issue than law enforcement, law enforcement certainly has a major role to play in terms of trafficking. Um, many countries do not have statutes that criminalize human trafficking. Um, I know of countries in which it's, um, the penalties for smuggling cigarettes into the country are greater than the penalties for smuggling people in. Um, and there are no penalties for exploiting the persons or for using force or coercion um, in it. Or where you have to go to statutes about rape or, um, or armed attacks or things of that sort and can't get to the trafficking itself um, and police systems aren't willing to use those other um, statutes. You need meaningful penalties, again, ones that will have some teeth in them um, and are commensurate with what the nature of the trafficking crimes are. Some cases, they're much too strong today. In other cases, more cases, they're much too weak. They're deficient in both directions, if not being appropriate to the level of criminality that takes place, or directed at the wrong people, directed at the low-level people who are most easy to catch allowing those who benefit the most from the trafficking to go off pretty much scot-free. Scot the prosecution certainly should be of those who traffic, not those who are trafficked. Um, and yet many countries would prefer to go after um, the victims um, to prosecute the prostitutes for prostitution rather than to look at the underlying crime and to find out and recognize that they have been trafficked. Um, I know of a very courageous judge in um, New Jersey who broke actually one of the um, biggest trafficking rings in that part um, of the country. Um, and they had been a police raid on a brothel um, and all of the prostitutes were um, apprehended, were brought before his court, it was a night court. And um, he asked about the ages and um, told all of them were over the age of 21. And you know, they were to be fined. And there was a lawyer there representing them. And the lawyer said, yep, judge, everyone is over the age of 21. And I've got the, you know, um, I, I can pay their fines. Um, I have the money. And the judge looked at a few, about six of the, um, of the prostitutes and said, hmm, they don't look 21 to me. And so he separated them out from the others. And he brought the lawyer before him and said to the lawyer, who's paying your fees? And the lawyer refused to tell him. And he said, well, if you refuse to tell me, I'm appointing a court, court, court appointed lawyer to represent these six people. It turned out that they were 14, 15 years old. If that judge had just accepted what he had been told, what the police had told him, what the lawyer had told him, they would still be trafficked. They would still be in the same exact situation. It was only until trust built up that they revealed what their circumstances had been. You certainly need to go after the corrupt officials, not just the trafficking operations themselves, because you have to go after the facilitators, those that allow trafficking to happen. You often then need specialized anti-trafficking units um, because very often it's the other people in the police forces and the judges who are the corrupt officials. Um, and generally, those specialized units have to be paid well so that they are not themselves then vulnerable to and get down that slippery slope. And certainly, you need training. Um, training of, at all levels of law enforcement. Again, it's the cop on the beat that is more likely to identify and find trafficking victims, but won't necessarily know that that's, that that's the kind of case that they've just unraveled. And then, in my view, because I come at this very much from a human rights perspective, um, the most important part of the policy framework needs to be adequate policies and practices for protecting. Um, 
that involves, first of all, having an ability to identify the trafficking survivors. And here I'm used, I've shifted from using the term victim, you may have noticed, to using the term survivor. And that's because those who have been trafficked are not just victims. They are also people who have a role in their own recovery, their own ability to lead their own lives. Again, it's part of this empowerment issue that I've been talking about as part of the um, prevention strategy. It has to come into play again when you reach the point of protecting those who have been trafficked um, to allow them to survive the incident and not just to continue to be victims forever after. Identifying them is really hard. Um, we have had a project at Georgetown in which we've been working with a number of NGOs trying to identify child victims of trafficking in the United States. Um, we have great legislation to protect them. The U.S. has phenomenally good legislation in this area. Um, some, again, those bad estimates um, that I mentioned before are that there can be tens of thousands, you know, the 18,000. Um, it's one estimate of just children who have been trafficked for sexual exploitation. That doesn't include the forced labor trafficking um, on that. Since the legislation is passed, we have fewer than 100 kids who have been identified as having been trafficked and have become the beneficiaries of that fantastic legislation. Um, and yet there are hospitals, there are police officers, there are social service um, people, there are employers, there are schools, there are lots of people who come into contact with these kids but don't necessarily know that they've been trafficked. And so identifying them is an important part of any kind of protection. They're out of sight, they're going to be out of mind and out of protection. Once they are identified, we need protection of them against retaliation by the traffickers. Um, I can't emphasize how much a lot of these traffickers are really, really mean people. They're really nasty people. Um, I was in Albania um, a couple of years ago um, doing some work on trafficking there and um, we went out with their equivalent of our Coast Guard, um, the Navy there, and they were showing us that the traffickers, the human smugglers and traffickers were using these bullet boats, very, very fast boats that could go into small coves and disappear and, and get out of sight. But the preferred activity was that three of them would go out at the same time. Um, one would have drugs and arms, drugs on one side, one would have arms on the other side, and the middle one would have people. And, they'd be, and if the Coast Guard encountered them, the traffickers threw the people overboard so they could save the drugs and the arms. So this is what we're talking about. Retaliation is real, um, and protection from retaliation is absolutely necessary. And that sometimes means witness protection for those who are identified, who are rescued, or who rescue themselves, um, and who are willing to testify against the traffickers. And it's not just witness protection for them, but it often means bringing their families from their home communities and getting protection for them also, because a lot of the traffickers will go after their families or at least hold that as a threat against the people who've been trafficked. And then you need solutions for the people who've been trafficked. In many cases, return home is the appropriate solution. Um, that the those who have been trafficked want to go home. They want to start their lives over again in a familiar place. But if they're sent back to exactly the same situation with no hope, no options, no opportunities, they are just vulnerable to further exploitation and we'll just see them coming out one more time. And so there has to be some type of reintegration assistance, some type of help, and not just individually in an isolated and marginalized manner, but it has to be in the context of their families, of their communities. One of my favorite programs is one in West Africa with boys who have been trafficked into fisheries. And there the program is operating in recognizing that there's both supply and demand. Um, and so the agency is working with the families of the trafficked boys who had very little options to provide them economic opportunities so they can support their families, giving them some new skills, helping them with loans to start businesses, doing various things to get them back 
um, into a, a, an acceptable economic situation. But they're also working with the fisheries to develop alternative technologies so they don't need the boys. Because the reason they need the boys is that they have small hands. They can dive in and release um, fish from the nets. And it's extremely dangerous, and a lot of boys die in the process. And so you're dealing with the supply and demand in a cohesive manner um, and protecting the boys in the process. Now, in some cases, return is just not possible. The retaliation will be too great. The lack of opportunities will be so enormous that they can't be dealt with. And in those cases, certainly protection in the destination country may be the best solution of all. But that means protecting in a way that people have a legal status. Um, they have a way that they can move into a new life and finally move into a new citizenship um, and become fully integrated in their host society. So let me say in summary, some of the main points to just summarize um, what I think are the essentials of a cohesive, coherent strategy to address trafficking. First is recognizing that trafficking is a global problem, um, and we're all in it. Um, we're all, all countries, whether it's as sources or as destinations, as supplies or demands, are culpable and have to have a role in finding the solutions. Um, while I don't believe we should be pointing fingers at others, um, we certainly should be pointing the fingers at ourselves to look at what is the problems, what are the, the things that we're doing that make trafficking attractive and profitable. Second, I think we have to address the underlying reasons that people are vulnerable to trafficking and not just deal with it as a surface issue, not just deal with the immediate, but deal with it over a longer range period. That means we need to focus on economic development, empowerment, gender roles, all of the things that I've been talking about um, throughout this um, presentation. And probably first and foremost, we have to think about the faces of the trafficked um, to realize that this is a phenomenon that affects people, affects individuals, um, and that really it is in looking at the faces of those who have been trafficked um, that we need to find the solutions to ensure that we prevent it, we protect them, and we prosecute those who are deserving of no help or satisfaction from us. Thank you. Martin has previously um, presented the questions and uh, points. You need to use the mic. From the, well, no, well, I think so, hopefully they can hear me. Um, the, she will take uh, questions, comments uh, directly from the floor. She'll direct, uh, just simply raise your hand, use the microphone here, line up for it so that we can all hear you. And uh, so uh, the floor is yours. Uh, again, thank you very much for a wonderfully clear and comprehensive review of the problem. Thank you. Hi. I was wondering if you could talk about the differences between the policies and responses on a national or transnational level versus those of a regional or local grassroots level. Okay. Um, first of all, it has to happen at all levels. I mean, dealing with trafficking can't be done just as a transnational crime. It eventually reaches the neighborhoods, the communities, um, where it's hidden away very often, but it's um, the places where it can be, um, be identified and addressed. Um, and that's part of the reason I'm so emphasizing the taking of responsibility and not just pushing it off to those other places or those other bad things. The other hand, there has to be, in my view, a transnational response because it is a transnational problem when we are talking about movements across borders. Um, and what we know from not just trafficking, but from dealing with migration more generally, where international movements of people, um, that unilateral policies generally are not effective. Um, that if it's a phenomenon that begins in a source country, usually goes through one or more transit countries, um, way stations, and then eventually ends up in a destination country, all of those partners have to coordinate and 
agree to both the law enforcement um, activities, but also to taking responsibility for protection and for prevention. Um, I think the, at the transnational or global level, um, the systems are still in development. Um, the protocol is recent, it has gone into force, and I must admit, um, relative to other human rights instruments, um, it's been one of the most rapidly uh, ratified um, legal instruments that we've ever seen. Um, within just a couple of years, it um, had enough signatures to be ratified. Um, the U.S. in a departure from much of our policies with regard to international treaties um, is fully on board um, with the trafficking protocol. Um, and the, but it's still new. Um, there are things now in place like a, a legislator's handbook, um, which the UN has developed, that is a guidance to national legislatures as to what to do in terms of the legal frameworks. Um, for dealing at least with the law enforcement and some of the other issues. Um, biggest problem I see is that the protocol is pretty strong on the prosecution P. Um, and it has a lot specifically there. It has a lot on interstate cooperation in addressing those aspects of trafficking. I think it's much weaker in terms of both prevention and protection. Um, and therefore, the international systems, um, while those who have ratified the protocol are required to cooperate on law enforcement, they are just encouraged to do certain things on protection. Um, um, you, you mentioned that, um, yeah, like prevention on the supply side, um, providing, um, the tra providing the potential victims with um, ec like economic opportunities and stuff. And you also mentioned about our profession on the demand side, um, telling the public about, you know, um, that you're getting the low prices because you're, you know, this is how your goods are supplied and stuff. Um, how would, you, like, but also uh, building up, uh, talking about your focus on incentives, um, do you, like, do you plan to limit the demand side of it purely by um, moral incentives? Or, I mean, if there's, if there's just more incentives and not, like, economic or financial incentives, then, how, do, how would you um, convince the public to actually uh, change their actions? Yeah, I'm, I'm a proponent of the carrot and stick approach. Um, that you know, having the incentives in place in order to be able to um, basically identify, let, let me step back. I think when you're talking about the demand side, you've got a few different categories of demand. You've got the people who are knowingly exploiting and they know what they're doing and they're doing it because they're looking to make a financial gain and they, and probably no incentives in the world are gonna help there. You're really talking about an effective set of sanctions and penalties um, and an enforcement capability to really identify that um, on it. But you also have a lot of others who are either turning a blind eye or not really looking at what it is that, what are the ramifications of the actions that they're taking. Um, and that's the group where I think the public education, the incentives could make some difference. Um, and then if it doesn't, I think you're back to the, to the sticks um, on it, that you can't do it all, you know, you have to have some, some real threats in place. Um, and that is one of the problems, because that means getting to the end user um, of the services. And that means, you know, basically getting to the average consumer, to the, um, to the Johns, not the prostitutes. If it's sexual exploitation, if it's forced labor, it's a much broader set of people. Um, and that's very tough. I mean, we're seeing it already in terms of, of unauthorized illegal migration into the country um, of an unwilling, you know, everybody complains about it, um, but relatively few um, people are willing to take steps that would be necessary in order to, um, to wean themselves of dependence on cheap exploitable labor. Um, and that just fuels it and it fuels the problem. Um, and yet, you know, if, if it's considered to be a problem, then that's the step I think we need to be taking. Um, I'm not so idealistic that I think it's going to be easy or, or straightforward, but um, I think at least trafficking is an area where some of what is happening is so heinous that you could actually um, 
galvanize sufficient political support in order to make meaningful penalties. That would go against on the, on the demand side. On the uh, prosecution side, are there efforts being made to deal with the money laundering aspects or are there special difficulties there? And a second question, uh, could you cite some NGOs that are making advances in the prevention side? Sure. Um, in terms of the money laundering is an important part of the law enforcement strategy um, because if you follow the money trail, that's really how you figure out who it is that's benefiting ultimately. Um, in terms of partic particularly the criminal operations themselves um, on that. Um, since 9-11, there are, are new teeth um, in the provisions for dealing with um, money laundering of all different types because of the concern about uh, terrorist groups um, taking use. And there's always an underlying fear that um, terrorist organizations will exploit the vulnerabilities that allow traffickers to you know, use immigration policies or use money laundering, you know, money transfer plans and things of that sort. So the securitization, um, you know, the thinking in that regard um, is pushing a little bit also in terms of getting more meaningful um, penalties in place. But yeah, money laundering is, is definitely an issue. In terms of NGOs, um, on the prevention side, um, again, much of it has been more of the public information. And um, there's a group called La Strada that works throughout Eastern Europe that does excellent information campaigns. And actually, what they've said is that the um, when they have a hotline, and they, much to their surprise, found that a lot of the calls that they get on the hotline are from the Johns, from the, the men who are using the brothels, who hear their public service announcements or their you know, their campaigns and think, oh, you know, that prostitute that I visited last week, um, you know, she looked like she was kind of frightened, and I wonder if she was trafficked, and so they call in with tips. Um, on it, so it's an indirect way of dealing with the demand side as well in terms of the prevention. Um, there are a number of development agencies that are just starting to get into trafficking as an issue um, and developing programs that are dealing with an economic development strategy in areas which are particularly vulnerable um, to trafficking. Um, there are also some human rights groups that have really picked up on the trafficking issues internationally. Um, and in some cases, in very um, innovative ways, there, there's a group that operates in um, Nigeria and Italy. Um, they have an Italian branch that is mostly Nigerian immigrants to Italy. They walk the streets, find streetwalkers, <laughs> um, prostitutes, talk to them, find out what their circumstances are. And if they find out that they've been trafficked, um, they don't coerce them or you know, try to force them into anything. Um, but they say, if you want to go, go back home, um, we will provide a way for you to get there. And their partner organization in Nigeria then puts them into skills training and income generation projects um, so that they will not be re-trafficked into Italy. So there are examples, but these are all small programs. And I'm expecting then the conference in the next couple of days, I'm hoping to learn about a lot more of this type of activity um, that's taking place, because I think what we need to do is figure out how to grow the best efforts um, in a way that can start addressing um, the causes um, in a much more consistent manner. I'm going to say something. Uh, on the docudramas that I've seen on TV, I want to thank U of I and you especially for putting color into this. Because what we see on TV is always Ukrainian, former U USSR women on, and never women of color who look like me, no red, brown, <laughs> or yellow people. Yeah, and I'm thinking, like, something's wrong with this. Yeah, it was actually interesting. My husband, who's in the audience, when I was showing him my PowerPoint, he, he immediately said, you know, who, whose pictures are you using you know, on, on that? And we went through it, and I realized that, and you know, I've sort of been, I guess, semi-consciously wanting to show all of the faces of trafficking. Um, and so you know, the, the pictures that I've shown you are European 
African, Asian, Latin American, because it's really important to demonstrate this is a global problem. Um, and in fact, women of color in particular are the ones who are most likely to be trafficked. Um, and again, if you think about it in terms of the, you know, purely the sort of Western prostitution, and that's your way into it, you get one-sided view of trafficking. If you think about it in terms of forced labor, domestic servitude, child soldiers, I mean, all of these other aspects of trafficking, you get a much broader view of what's happening and realize that um, it's affecting an awful lot of people from an awful lot of backgrounds, a lot of religions, a, a lot of nationalities, a lot of ethnic groups, um, and it's very, very universal. Also, I want to ask you, what happens when people take, men take the sex tours, like in Thailand and places like that? Do, will the local police notify the embassy so when they go back to their countries, UK or America, are they not prosecuted in our country? Yeah. Thank there you. Is a growth in legislation um, criminalizing sex tourism, but with children, it's almost all of it is aimed at um, at sex tourism affecting child prostitution. Um, but where, what, wherever it happens in the world, whether it's legal or illegal there, um, it's made illegal in the country um, from which the sex tourists are going. Um, and it's there have been some noted cases, some successful prosecutions that have given some attention to this. Um, but identifying on both sides is very, very difficult. Um, it's something which uh, it's, you know, unless you have really, really good um, cooperation amongst law enforcement agencies, um, proving a case is extremely hard. And that's again why, going back to the first question, why the transnational part of this is so important, um, because you're not going to get to um, a lot of the problems if you're dealing with it at only one end of the chain. You have to be able to deal with it in a more comprehensive manner. On the prevention question, I'm, I'm curious, uh, as, is there something that we as a public can do other than be educated? That is, are there companies who use trafficked labor to produce their goods or maybe source countries for products that we can be aware of and perhaps avoid and and uh, sort of cut down on on the supply on the demand I'm sorry um, there actually have been some successful campaigns in agriculture um, in that respect the Taco Bell case I don't know if you are familiar with it but it the there um, was a union trying to organize um, in Florida, um, just blanked on the name of the town. Yeah, um, on that end. Um, it actually, the one of the starting points of the galvanizing of the workers to organize was a trafficking case. It was a forced labor case um, that occurred there and that sort of brought them together. And they had a concerted effort because they found that the growers were supplying Taco Bell and they went after Taco Bell rather than just going after the growers. Um, and it, Taco Bell has settled um, with them. So um, I think that there are things that can be done um, in terms of the organizing against um, particularly egregious cases where it's pretty clear and uh, there's a consumer strength in organizing against um, those activities. Um, I think we've seen some of that with regard to child labor um, in various places if students, colleges all over the country have um, organized to make sure that the, um, you know, the t-shirts and sweatshirts and stuff that are, are sold in the libraries are made in accordance with, um, with labor standards, uh, recognized labor standards, and that helps in terms of diminishing the likelihood of trafficking. Um, so yeah, um, I think there are some things that can be done. Um, I, I think that though if you get back to the underlying causes, and you're really talking not just to get about the demand side, but also about the supply side thing, um, then I think the, you know, the other side of what, you know, I mean, I think it's criminal how little wealthy countries are spending um, in terms of foreign aid uh, for the poor countries, in terms of um, their, the trade, agricultural subsidies. I mean, I could go through the litany of things that most of you probably 
know about, which are you know our public policies that um, allow or foster poverty in other places, which then make for this type of vulnerability uh, to trafficking and a lot of other problems. Um, and so focusing on that end of things um, would also help, it would help tremendously. Um, interestingly, and I think it, you know, it's, a, it's a, another side of this whole thing, um, if you look at the amount of money that migrants, I'm not talking here about trafficked, but all, all international migrants, send back to their home countries in the developing world. Um, the World Bank is now estimating that it's in excess of about 180 to $200 billion per year. If you look at official development assistance by all of the OECD countries, the rich countries of the world, um, it's been averaging about $60 billion a year. And so international migrants who are usually the poorest of the people who are living in the richest countries are sending back three times as much um, in aid to their families and their communities um, than we do as taxpayers. Um, and that says something. Um, it also is one of the reasons that trafficking happens because when people are, you know, are looking for better opportunities, they know about others who are earning money or sending it back. They, they want to do the same thing. If there aren't legal ways of, of migrating, they'll take whatever risks they can. Um, and having taken those risks, they become very, very vulnerable to the traffickers. Um, and so there, I think there are lots of things that we could be doing um, as a country and as a rich, rich societies together. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, one is, a lot of countries have the laws and policies in place to protect victims or to criminalize traffickers, but um, I've seen there's a kind of a time gap between the like the making of those policies and then the actual implementation of them. You talked about meaningful penalties. Um, have you seen a country or a case that has kind of efficiently implemented those policies that we could look at? <laughs> um, and what were are the factors yeah. maybe involved in that? And my second question is kind of about an obscure point that you had, but you talked about um, the Milosevic regime um, encouraging trafficking um, to get back at NATO. Can you maybe say a little bit more about that? Sure, okay. Um, on the first in terms of best practices, um, this is an area where I think the U.S. actually is well ahead of other countries. I mean, I think we can be proud of a lot of what we're doing um, in the United States in terms of our legal frameworks, our uh, policies. We could do a whole lot more. I'm not you know, trying to be an apologist for, um, for U.S. government policies. Um, but we've been at it a bit longer, and we um, really have paved the way in many respects um, on that. And other countries are looking very closely at what the U.S. is doing. Um, the problem is implementation. You know, it, it's my you know, 70 or so children who have been identified out of whatever number may be out there. And that's, that is where the problem um, resides. And that takes you know, time and effort and money, um, political will, lots of different things um, to make that happen. Um, in terms of the um, Milosevic example, um, Milosevic um, allowed a particularly Chinese trafficking operation, smuggling operation, it was doing both um, at the same time, to operate through Serbia um, into Bosnia for the peacekeepers you know, side of things that I already talked about, um, but also through Bosnia, through the Serb part of Bosnia, into um, Western Europe and to the United States. Um, and over time, there was actually a buildup of the Chinese migrants in Belgrade um, to the point where there was a, a, a little Chinatown that was established there. Not so little, it was about 10,000 people when I visited there um, just after the Milosevic regime <laughs> fell. Um, and it, they, from what all of the um, government and UN officials that I talked to on the site visit that I did, um, what they were all saying was that the Milosevic regime did it for a number of reasons. One, it was that it was using the tra it was getting cut of the trafficking um, and smuggling and was using it to supplement their, their own pockets, but also the government 
revenues, um, and so that they, they, there was a financial interest that they had in it. Um, but that beyond that, um, he saw this as a vulnerability in the West, a concern that they had, um, and was very willing to exploit it. Um, and then he, at a certain point, realized that it wasn't as, quite as efficient as they thought it was, and that Serbia was not just being a transit point, and that's when it, um, it became an issue domestically in Serbia. We were really taxing our speaker, but there's one more question before we possibly end our section of time here. If not, uh, on behalf of uh, everyone here, let me just say this is a wonderfully textured, enriched, uh, we now know what our problems are. <laughs> <laughs> it's impressive. Uh, but at least you've offered us a whole range of ways in which we can address it. It's a rare combination of knowledge and action, and we applaud you for it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.